Today is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Simon Jowitt, who is currently a tenured associate professor of economic geology at the University of Nevada in Las Vegas, USA. A bit of background, um, Simon has a bachelor degree in geology from the University of Edinburgh, then a master in mining geology from the Camborne School of Mines, and then a PhD from the University of Leicester, all in the UK. Then Simon spent eight years at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia, before moving to his current position at UNLV. Uh, Simon's research focuses on the use of geochemistry to unravel geological processes and the links between magmatism and metallogeny in a variety of settings. Um, Simon has also undertaken extensive research on mineral economics, global metal resources, and the security of supply of the critical elements. And Simon also studies the environmental impact of mining and the potential uses of mining and other wastes, waste for metal production and CO2 sequestration. And finally, um, Simon has published more than 100 scientific papers and peer-reviewed book chapters since 2010. He is currently the vice president of, for student affairs for the Society of Economic Geologists, and he was awarded the SCG's uh, Waldemar, Waldemar Lindgren Award in 2014. Um, that said, it's all yours. I was going to say, is there any time for me left to actually give my talk now? But, uh... <laughs> Thank you for the uh, the opportunity to uh, give this talk as part of this uh, seminar series. It's uh, it's been a pleasure coming down here to Tucson for the first time. Um, okay, without further ado, so uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, climate change mitigation and the energy transition. So I'm basically what we're considering to be kind of current and future drivers of the mineral industry. Um, but before I kind of get into that a little bit, I just want to be a, a little bit provocative and say that mining is old, problematic, dirty, problematic, and we don't need it anymore. I mean, obviously, hopefully nobody in this room actually, really actually thinks that, but this is the kind of thing we're essentially battling against in the significant proportion of the general public, even in areas like Arizona and Nevada, where there's significant amounts of mining going on. I know senior students at UNLV who don't think there's any mining in Nevada. I'm sure there's similar students here in, our, in, in Tucson as well. Uh, but as I say here, hopefully you all know the previous statement is incorrect. Uh, mining has been around for centuries. Uh, I understand Adam Simon talked a bit about the history of mining the last, in the last of these seminars. It's going to be, it's been around for centuries. It's going to be vital for it's my, vital for modern life, and it's going to continue to be vital for modern life for the foreseeable future, needed to meet the UN Sustainable Development Goals and, and much more. In other words, modern society is essentially reliant on the minerals industry in many ways. However, as I said in the previous slide, comparatively few people acknowledge or even think about this. We can see this in countries or states with mining, like if you look at Australia, people actually protesting mining conferences, and the a lack of willingness of banks to actually even kind of deal with societies and organizations who actually have the word mining in kind of their, their titles and things like this. Uh, there's people that say mining is dirty, harms the environment and people. Perhaps that's the case, but mining companies do a far better job, not perfect, but nobody's perfect job of environmental assessments, cleanup, et cetera. And mining certainly provides communities with benefits, and there's a big focus in the minerals industry on improving this going forward. More importantly, potentially, meaningful climate change mitigation, limiting carbon dioxide emissions requires mining, more mining than we probably have ever done at any point in human history. And I'm going to show data to back this up, claim, this claim up shortly. But before we get into that, I just wanted to remind people why mining is so important uh, to modern life, why modern standards of living essentially need mining. So this is, uh, this is produced each year by the, uh, the, the Minerals Education Coalition here in the US. Uh, I've actually added metric data for people who use the metric system. But basically, every year, American born is going to need about 3.19 million pounds of minerals, metals, and fuels in their lifetime. That includes nearly half a ton of copper, uh, lots of natural gas, a lot of zinc, salt, lead, coal, clay, iron ore, phosphate, an awful lot of other minerals, and so on. So and these numbers, with the exception of perhaps coal, maybe natural gas eventually, but these numbers don't generally decrease. They only increase. If we look at why the, the reasons why that's the case, here on the left, we have a 1980s unsmartphone and the range of elements we actually use in that, in that, in that technology. 
Here we have basically what we have most, most people, if not all people in the room, have one of these in their pocket and the range of elements we basically use to give us the things we expect in modern smart technology. Uh, what we've done from the 1980s to more or less the present day in all varieties of technology is add a whole load of elements that gives us things like touch screens, like color screens, like extended battery life, smart technology. We've removed two, we've removed essentially beryllium and lead, but added a huge range of other elements. And that means that all of the technology we consider to be routine, part of modern living, is more mineral and metal intensive than probably at any other time in human history. If we look at the elements of a smartphone, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but there's things like indium tin oxide coverings, which give you a touch screen, rare earths give you colors. Uh, we've got things like uh, uh, nickel and other elements in microphones, electrical connectivity. We've got things like lithium ion batteries. We're hearing a lot of lithium about, uh, about lithium these days, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about uh, lithium ion batteries later on. But basically, the range of elements we have in modern technology is what makes modern technology smart, or basically gives us what we expect from modern technology. Equally, if we think about renewable energy, here's a, a wind turbine, you know, containing two tons of rare earth elements in the generating part of the turbine system in, in, in the form of magnets, aluminum, uh, some zinc, some molybdenum, a lot of concrete, a lot of steel, a lot of copper. And this is just a three megawatt, three megawatt turbine. If you imagine you need an awful lot of these to generate significant amounts of electricity, that's an awful lot of metal and minerals we require for this type of renewable energy. So that's just a few examples of how the things we take for granted, uh, essentially for granted as part of modern life require metals and minerals. Minerals and metals are the basis or the material basis of modern society. And that is fundamentally why we need mining. If we want a modern standard of living, we're gonna need mining and that's not gonna change. This, if you combine with that with increases in population, why we as humanity mine more metals and minerals than any other time in human history. This is a trend that's been an underlying trend for the last century. I'll show some data to supplement that shortly. These trends are not going away. These trends are actually likely to accelerate as a result of meaningful climate change mitigation. In other words, the metals and mineral demands from low and zero carbon dioxide energy generation, storage, transport and so on and associated grid infrastructure and other things all of this means that probably in the very near future we're going to see metal and mining uh, metal and mineral demand increase rapidly it's already happening for a range of minerals and, and metals that we're, we're seeing that those demands increase right now this is a few examples so this is just copper production i'm not going to go into these in any detail in, uh, in in the next few graphs but copper production from 1900 through to about 2015 uh, you can see significant amounts of copper produced by the us australia canada chile with a large porphyry copper systems there china latin america and so on basically the the one thing i want you to take away from this is the overall trend is up and it's rapidly up and we're currently around here around 20, 20 and a half million tons of copper production a year. That trend is not going away. And that trend is repeated in other metals. Here we have an example of zinc, zinc 1840 through to getting close to the present day. You see exactly the same trend. You'll see this in basically most of the minerals and metals you can think about with the exception of things that we don't really use anymore. For example, maybe asbestos. Asbestos production is not significantly increasing in this uh, way for, for obvious reasons. If you actually put all of that together and you get end up something like this, this is looking at global production from 1956 through to 2018, 2020. What I've done here is I've actually normalized all these data to the value of production in 1956. We've got a range of commodities here. And one thing to note is that the data are a little noisy, but all these trends are going up, up this way. Some shallow, some are increasing shallowly, maybe fluctuating between ups and downs, some increasing moderately. Some like the rare earths up here, we use 32 times more rare earths or we mine 32 times more rare earths now than we did in the 1950s because we use them in everything, in our laptops and our smartphones, in magnets for our electric vehicles and so on. You can argue that this is because global population has also increased. So if we take this, these data, we normalize them so they're now per capita. In other words, we laterally normalize this for increases in population. You see that the trends still increase. Every human on this earth uses 10 times more mined rare earths than they did in the 50s. 
Same goes for these other metals here. You know, you've got cobalt up here. We're using like three or four times more cobalt than we did in the 1950s per head of population. So in other words, it's not just that the world population has increased. It's the fact that everybody on this earth wants modern level of modern standard of living, or the vast majority do, and that modern standard of living is metal and mineral intensive. So these are the underlying trends we're seeing in terms of metal production. These trends have been continuous since the 1950s or before. These trends are not going away. What we need to think about is what happens with mining, with things like climate change mitigation, where we superimpose extra demand on top of these already fairly steep curves. So what we've got here is just a, this is a little wordy slide, but if we've got a honey hope of meeting carbon dioxide emission targets, we're gonna need more mining than we ever have, than we have right now. And that mining is already at a level that we haven't achieved before. We already recycle more metals than we ever have done before as well. If you wanna get into specifics, the International Energy Agency has a two degree temperature increase target. Uh, in other words, we're limiting carbon dioxide emissions to about a thousand gigatons. Uh, where current annual production is 33 gigatons. So uh, kind of, if we everything maintained the same for the next, say, uh, uh, what, uh, till 2100, we'd basically emit uh, nearly 3000 gigatons or, or three times that more than we need to emit over that time period to hit that two degree temperature increase. The bottom line is for meaningful climate change mitigation, we need carbon dioxide emissions to decrease by 60% by 2050, then move towards carbon neutrality afterwards. In other words, the use of renewable energy, uh, generation, re uh, energy storage, zero carbon dioxide transport and so on. That is also being driven by consumer demand. People want Teslas, people want electric vehicles, people want energy generated from renewable sources, especially given when uh, Russia threatens to cut off your gas supply and so on. Uh, so what we have is an increased consumer demand as well as move towards climate mitigation. This is making the metal and mineral demand increases we're seeing as a result of changing technologies like this kind of inevitable. If we take electric vehicles as an example, they require more metal and petrol vehicles or gas vehicles. There's no point powering an electric vehicle from a coal-fired power station. It's worse than a gas-guzzling inefficient petrol or gas SUV. Resources and reserves of many metals, uh, we've done a quite a lot of work on this recently, it's somewhat sufficient for current trends, but these increases in demand are certainly gonna put pressure on the, on the minerals industry. And these increases in demand may happen rapidly and bringing new metal and mineral deposits on stream and mining them is a slow process in many ways. Some of you in the audience may not believe in anthropogenic climate change. I'll get rid of this elephant in the room to begin with. Uh, hopefully that doesn't apply, but even if it does, it doesn't matter because science doesn't really care what you believe in. The other thing is, and more importantly, in some ways, we're already shifting to low carbon dioxide energy generation and transport. It's a global movement. It's being driven by consumer sentiment and investment funding. In other words, there's money behind this trend and it's not going away. The metal mining, processing of metals and metal ores, green technology, energy development, all of this, also involve the production of high value raw materials and other potential to generate a lot of well-paid jobs. If we embrace this, those jobs can be here rather than say in China where we do the vast majority of processing and manufacturing right now. If we have a look at electric vehicles as a starting point or cars as a starting point, here we have three cars. One is a, a gas vehicle, one is a hybrid, one is a battery electric vehicle. Here's the range of copper we have. We have 50, nearly 50 pounds of copper in a normal vehicle, 88 pounds of copper in a hybrid, 183 pounds of copper in a battery electric vehicle. So nearly four times as much copper in this battery electric vehicle as this gas vehicle. I don't know why the creators of this graphic decided to make the battery electric vehicle more sporty than the typical gas vehicle. Maybe you can blame the Copper Development Association. They're trying to sell more copper. But anyway, that's by the by. If we do a back of the envelope calculation, Currently, the global vehicle manufacturing industry uses about a million tons of copper a year. We take about 20 uh, million tons of copper production. That's about 5% of global copper production and only 1%, maybe slightly more now, these new vehicles are electric. Policymakers are aiming to move to all electric vehicle fleets by 2035, 2050 or so on. If we assume the world agrees to go to all electric vehicles by 2060, that means electric vehicles 
which need four times as much copper as a gas vehicle or petrol vehicle, the global car industry are going to need 4 million tons of copper production a year, assuming no growth in new vehicle demand, 400% increase from now, 20% of global copper production, which needs to come from somewhere. Only it's more, because Teslas need grid infrastructure, they need charging stations, you need all of this infrastructure which requires more copper to actually enable the use of these electric vehicles and also derive that energy from renewable sources. And this is just transport and this is just copper. If we actually think about this and expand our thinking, think about energy generation and other sectors, uh, this is a, one example, just look at electric vehicle, vehicle batteries. Here we are in 2018, about a million tons of metals and minerals going into electric vehicle batteries. Predictions by 2030, which is about, what, eight years away now, slightly less. Uh, we're talking eight million tons of manganese, lithium, cobalt, nickel, graphite, aluminum, copper, and so on, all just going into metal lithium ion battery packs in passenger electric vehicles. And this trend is happening right now, and this trend isn't going away anytime soon. If we think about energy generation, renewable energy generation and electric vehicles and so on, these are data from the, uh, from the World Bank in the, uh, 2020, uh, just looking at basically comparing 2050 predicted demand from renewable energy generation and uh, energy storage and so on, uh, for predicted demand from 2050 compared to the present day. So on the right, we have annual demand from energy technologies in 2050 in terms of millions of tons, so about five and a half million tons of aluminum, or nearly five million tons of graphite, nearly two and a half million tons of nickel. On the left here, we have these data compared to production in 2018. So if we look at energy technologies alone by 2050, we're talking nearly 500% increases in demand for graphite and lithium and cobalt, 250% for indium, 200% for vanadium, and this is a kind of crucial one, 100% increase in demand for nickel. We already mine a lot of nickel. We mine about two and a half million tons of nickel globally. There's a lot of nickel mines around. If we want to actually meet this predicted demand, we need to essentially double the amount of nickel we mine. We need to double the amount of nickel mines we have. Uh, and so on. There's other things here. There's lead, zinc, copper. Copper is only a small increase. But the thing to take away from copper is that this is just from energy technologies. This is not for grid infrastructure and the like, which is where we're going to use more and more copper if we want to enable people to use their electric vehicles. If we look at that in numbers, here we have our minerals. Here we have our 2018 annual production in thousands of tons. Here we have a projected annual demand from energy technology alone in 2050. And then right here, we have 2050 projected annual demand as a percentage of current production. The thing, other thing to note here is that this demand is just from the energy technology alone. In other words, we'll need, say, 231% of current Indian production to go into energy technologies, never mind all that Indian you use on the touchscreens on your laptops and smartphones. So we're going to see increased demand, and this demand is going to compete with other uses for these metals, unless we can satisfy the demand for everything. So the so World Bank and International Energy Agency, they basically reckon that if we want to move or continue on in the energy transition, we're going to need about 3 billion tons of metals and minerals to deploy wind, solar and geothermal power, electric vehicles, energy storage, all of this to achieve this below 2 degrees centigrade increase in, in global temperature and carbon neutrality. If you add to this required upgrades to the grid and other infrastructure, this adds even more demand. And, you know, this adds, this needs mining, this needs lots of mining, but it's not the only thing we need to consider here. And also, you know, I may be kind of a bit doom and gloom here, but if you're in the minerals industry, this is probably a really good thing. We're going to see unprecedented demand for metals and minerals. You know, we're already mined more than we ever have done before. But what we're going to need in the future is even more mining. So this is a good thing. If, for example, you're a geoscience student or somebody who's interested in getting to the minerals industry, because the minerals industry is going to be really, really important or even more important in the next few years, decades even. It's not easy to rapidly ramp up production of any metal. Finding a new copper mine and nickel mine is difficult. Bringing those mines onto stream is even harder in the case of problematic permitting and so on. If you go back a few slides, there's also a few odd metals on here like neodymium, lithium and so on. So there's a whole range of metals like this, as well as our base metals. We have critical metals that could be even more problematic for a low carbon dioxide future. 
you probably heard about critical metals a lot. People talking about them on the news and so on. But this is what the US Department of the Interior or the US federal government currently considers to be critical. So in other words, this is the US viewpoint of criticality or critical metals. Uh, I sometimes show this to my students and try and read out the entire list in one, but I'm not going to do that here. You can read this at your leisure. Uh, but one thing is that this list of critical minerals reflects the US viewpoint. So for example, there's no molybdenum on here because we actually uh, have enough sources of molybdenum so that these metals are not considered critical. But there are metals like nickel, like zinc, the rare earths scattered throughout here. There's things like graphite and so on. And this is a dynamic and periodically updated list. People often talk about critical minerals, but what do we actually mean by critical minerals? There's no strict definition of what they are, but in general, they provide essential properties to a technology or product, especially green technologies, low carbon dioxide technologies, electric vehicles. These are vital for climate change mitigation. They also have things like strategic uses. So they're used in defense technologies as well as energy generation and so on. They're not easily substituted. They're recycled at very low rates often. And recycling can't meet increasing demand. If you think about electric vehicles, again, if we recycle all the electric vehicles that are currently in circulation, say we've got a million electric vehicles, that's probably uh, uh, enough lithium to generate electric batteries for another million vehicles. But all those vehicles that we're recycling need to be replaced and the electric vehicle demand is increasing. So recycling, even if we could recycle at good, decent rates, can't meet significant increases in demand. The subject to supply chain risk, they're often strategic, and some of them are produced as main products. I mean, nickel and zinc are on this list. They're produced as main products at uh, smelters and so on. Uh, some of them, or quite often, uh, they're produced as byproducts of other metals. Cobalt is a good example of this, but we can include in here indium that we use in our touchscreens, tellurium that we use in, in solar panels and so on. All of which means they're kind of uncertain what values actually accrue for the source mine in many cases. We already have significant unrealized potential of certainly these byproducts. Critical metals often are lost to waste rather than being produced. So in other words, that we're moving them around in supply chains. We're not actually extracting them primarily because of economics, mineral processing approaches, and basically because we don't know where they are in mineral deposits, or we don't know how they behave during processing, smelting, and so on. And resources are often poorly reported. Numerous mines produce critical metals but these are not stated in resource reserve reporting. In other words, quite often for these critical metals, especially low abundance critical metals like indium, tellurium, and so on, we don't know how much we already have in known resources and reserves. This is an example. This looks at substitution. So this basically, uh, if we have a, a lot, nice color like this, that means we can actually substitute other metals in for the, the elements we have up here. But in generally, what you'll notice is throughout the uh, periodic table, the vast majority of substitute performance is pretty poor. In other words, we can take copper, we can use aluminum wiring instead of copper wiring, but the performance exchange or the loss of performance there is pretty significant. And the other thing to know that a lot of these colors and these darker colors with poor substitute performance are elements like the rare earth elements along here that we consider critical and uh, several other rare earth elements like manganese and so on that are scattered through here. In other words, we can't just replace things with another metal because of a lack of supply. They're, they're not really substitutable. If we look at critical metals, this is the Yale wheel of companionality. We've got major metals here and the closer other elements are to the middle of these wheels or these sectors, the more reliant we are or the more reliant with the production of these metals is on the production of this main metal here. In other words, if we look at cadmium, indium, germanium, the vast majority of these metals are produced as a byproduct of zinc, selenium, and tellurium from copper and so on. In other words, we have a reliance relationship. If something happens to nickel production, we lose out on all of these elements here because zinc production would actually decrease and hence the production of these byproducts also decreases. We can show that a different way. These are critical metals or metals considered generally critical metals and minerals. These are main or co-product, the things we actually mine typically. These are a bit of both. Some of these are produced as byproducts. Some of these are as, as co-products, so significant uh, economic value. And these are the things that are really problematic, the byproducts. So selenium, tellurium, scandium, often the uh, indium, germanium, gallium, cobalt, bismuth, arsenic, a little bit, of, and so on. <laughs> if we put it more simply, 
Uh, we've got a table here. So here are our main metals, copper, zinc, tin, nickel, platinum, aluminum, iron, and lead. Here are our byproducts. So in other words, copper, molybdenum, platinum group metals produced as a byproduct of copper. Uh, nickel produces cobalt and so on. Zinc, you get indium, germanium, and cadmium and so on. Why am I telling you this? If, for example, we develop a new technology, that doesn't mean we don't need to galvanize steel with zinc anymore for, for rust proofing and the like. If zinc demand as a result drops and production drops, we lose the production of indium, germanium, cadmium. In other words, we lose our touch screens, LEDs, fiber optic cables, semiconductors, cadmium telluride, solar panels, so on. All of this basically is another indication of why we consider these critical, these metals critical. It's their reliance on the production of other metals. So it's not just the fact that they're comparatively rare, it's the fact that they're reliant on the production of something else. And that means that they have inherently insecure supply chains. We look at an example of that. There is some good to come out of this because these things are often lost to waste. That means waste materials globally from mine sites actually have significant potential for the production of these metals. Uh, this is one example. This is the Broken Hill Ore Body in Australia, a lead zinc mine, pretty famous lead zinc mine where uh, BHP or Broken Hill Proprietary got their start. Mining in 1883 through to kind of getting close to the present day, we know there's indium in the mineral deposit there. We know indium wasn't produced. That means indium is in waste material at the site. And if we actually look at how much indium we predict is making its way into that waste material, be it 5%, 20%, or optimistically 35%, we can then use that to estimate how much remains within waste material on site, essentially waiting to be reprocessed for critical metals. We take the optimistic viewpoint, you know, we're thinking maybe there's three and a half thousand tons of indium in tailings at Broken Hill. Current global production is 800 tons a year. That means basically we've got three or four, well, four or so years of global production sat in waste material at one mine site in Australia. And this is obviously extrapolated over many other areas. And this is just a function of the fact that up until, say, the last 20 or 30 years, we had no real use for indium. Didn't bother mining it, didn't bother extract. Well, we mined it, we didn't bother extracting it because we had no use for it, there was no market for it. What's happening is the changes we're seeing in modern society, modern standards of living, have meant that we have now got markets for things we didn't mine or didn't extract before, and all of a sudden there's potential of generating wealth from waste, as well as making more use of the ore bodies we already mine. What do we know about critical metal resources? Uh, few critical metal resources are well quantified. Some have significant uncertainties or little to no data are actually available in terms of global resources or sometimes even production. You know, the USGS, the British Geological Survey are key sources of information on global production of these metals. Even they have data that sometimes contrast or sometimes we don't actually or, or don't actually have the data for them. So the question then is how can we assess the criticality of a metal or basically look at security of supply without knowing where the metals are coming from and how much we have already identified in mineral resources sat in the ground that we're already mining? How can we produce more of these metals and ensure supply given by and co-product nature? But you know, in many cases for these critical metals, we don't know how much we have. We don't know where what we have comes from, or we don't know how to increase production as a result. That means there's lots of challenges for increasing or meeting the demand increases we're seeing for these metals as a result. So there's lots of challenges here, but every challenge is also an opportunity. <laughs> People often say, okay, we need, we're going to see increasing demand for metals. Why don't we just recycle stuff? Recycling is great. We already recycle a lot. Not all metals can be recycled or not all metals and minerals can be recycled, depending on how we use them. One example of that is phosphate used as a fertilizer. If you spread your phosphate fertilizer on a field, it's going to be very difficult to recycle that afterwards. It's a dissipative use. The significant barriers to recycling of some metals, where the way we design modern technologies is not conducive to recycling. There's technological barriers. There's also logistical barriers. How many people in this room have an old mobile phone, cell phone sat in a drawer at home not being recycled? A significant proportion. And that's just one barrier. That's what happens to a lot of modern technologies. Certain companies now, when you buy a new phone, they'll give you a discount if you send your old phone in. But that's not always the case. And people often always don't often always do that. The other thing, as I mentioned earlier, recycling can't always meet increasing demand. Some organizations may suggest that that isn't the case, but they actually 
in that case, I would argue they don't understand the data. Uh, certainly recycling can't meet increasing demand for a lot of the metals we're talking about here. Product design means that a lot of the metals in the waste material simply are not designed for recycling. There's moves to change this, but a lot of the stuff we use is going to end up in landfills. And as I mentioned, you can't just substitute one metal for another. So recycling is good. There's lots of potential for increased recycling, but this is not the kind of holy grail that some organizations and people make it out to be. If we look at current recycling rates, this is the challenge. The base metals, precious metals, we recycle at fairly high rates, greater than 50%. Critical metals, like the rare earths, like lithium, beryllium, germanium, gallium, selenium, tel selenium, tellurium, and so on, we recycle at rates 1% or less. In other words, th this is slowly changing, but I'm sure we've all seen lithium ion batteries catch fire as the Tesla has been in involved in an accident and so on. So the handling of these things like lithium ion batteries is one barrier to increasing this. But you know, the, the, this will increase, but it's gonna increase slowly. And up until a point where we reach kind of the recycling rates of the base metals, that essentially means that all of the lithium we mine, all of the rare earths we mine to put in magnets, to put in lithium ion batteries is essentially one use. And then we ditch it. So that's that needs to change, but it's not going to change rapidly. And that means that even if it did change, or even if it did change rapidly, it couldn't meet the increasing demand we're seeing. But the fact is it won't increase rapidly from this 1% or less value. And hence, we need to think about mining as a solution for the increasing demand. There are significant potentials here. This is a, a, a good paper in Environmental Science and Technology from a few years ago, which looks at what could be recycled. So in other words, what we've got is our, our potentially recyclable, our currently unrecyclable, which is kind of the next level up in terms of what we should aim for, and then the stuff that will never be recycled. So like a, basically a, 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 a quarter or so of zinc use will never be recycled. Same for mercury, significant proportions of some of these heavy rare earths down here. So everything in this color is something we could recycle and should recycle potentially. This is stuff that needs technological breakthroughs and this is the stuff that will never happen. So there is significant potential for increasing the recycling of these elements, which would be great. But as I say, it can't meet increasing demand and that's where the minerals industry will come in in due course. If we have a look at this, uh, this is an, just a little bit of work I've been doing on nickel. I wanted to look at nickel as an example of problems and opportunities. Nickel is a metal that's fundamentally important to modern life society. We use it in stainless steels. We use it in specialty alloys. We use it in electroplating. We use it in lithium ion batteries. You can either put lithium, you can either put nickel, or you can put cobalt in your lithium ion batteries. They're the two commonly used metals, uh, in the, as well as lithium in these batteries. Uh, but if we actually move towards nickel, because basically nickel is a, a certainly good for batteries for electric vehicles, we're going to see, as I say, a significant increase in nickel demand, 100% or so by 2050. This is the great use of batteries for energy storage, hence a greater demand for nickel. What I'm going to have a quick look at is a quick, uh, basically global nickel demand and supply and implications and opportunities. Uh, we had a paper out in this in economic geology this year with more details, but certainly this is something that kind of applies to many metals and minerals and, and indicates the kind of thinking we need to employ when, when looking at this uh, increase in demand we're facing. If we look at the use of nickel, uh, this is current uses. So batteries are only 3% of the current use of nickel. We get you plating 8%, alloy steels and casting, non-ferrous alloys and stainless steel is the big user right now of global nickel, 72%. But this is what's going to increase this 3% wedge of this pie is going to increase significantly over the next decades. If we look at this, this is uh, looking at essentially a nickel supply from 2016 through to 2050. So around here right now with our, our small nickel, small amount of the nickel sector uh, being used to produce lithium ion batteries. But as you can see, basically by 2030, what you're talking about is 5 million tons of nickel production and basically this increase in demand, so this is 2030, this increase in demand here, this wedge here is actually all down to battery use, lithium ion batteries, mainly in electric vehicles. All of this means that nickel, like a lot of the elements we discussed today, uh, is likely to rapidly increase, uh, nickel demand is likely to rapidly increase as a result of the use in batteries, 
Uh, whether you like Elon Musk or not, he's got a good turn of phrase, and I'm just quoting him here. Our cells should be called nickel graphite because primarily the cathode is nickel, the anode side is graphite with silicon oxide. There's a little bit of lithium in there, but it's like the salt on the solid. In other words, the, the main components in electric vehicle batteries are either nickel and cobalt and graphite with lithium in between to help the entire thing come together. If we look at 2020, so this is a, a looking at the compounds we use in, uh, in lithium ion batteries in 2020 and predicted by 2030, you see a significant amount of the proportion of lithium ion batteries in 2030 are predicted to be nickel compounds or nickel bearing compounds with other things like lithium ion phosphate and lithium manganese, nickel cobalt and so on. This is because the, the energy density of these lithium ion batteries which contain nickel are higher than some of the other compounds that are out there. So they're the best kind of energy technologies we have for electric vehicles. And that's why there's a significant amount of focus on nickel right now. The question is, can we meet more than 100% nickel, 100% increase in nickel mine production by 2050? If so, where's it going to come from? You know, we can understand the demand drivers. It's this energy transition. It's lithium ion batteries and so on. Uh, we can look at our current nickel resources and reserves in our paper. And we did this in our paper in economic geology this year. We know that the majority of nickel has, uh, has been and will continue to be sourced from nickel laterites and magnetic sulfide systems. So the question is, do we actually produce more of these laterites and magmatic sulfide systems? If so, where do we find them? Do we find other deposits like manganese nodules on the seafloor or hydrothermal nickel deposits? These have previously might have been mined for nickel, although the potential remains there and remains uncertain, but maybe that's the way to go. But there are other factors that could come into play here. Certainly government policy, uh, US federal government, if you're actually developing a critical metals project here in the US or a project that will produce a critical metal, you should have expedited permitting. In other words, if you've got a nickel project somewhere in the US, that permitting for that project should in theory proceed faster than say a copper project because copper is not considered critical. Whether this is true in reality or not, is another, uh, I'm not gonna comment on the US federal government in detail, but certainly this is this in theory should be the case and this is the legislature in place to actually indicate this. One other thing to think about is carbon trading. Uh, this is coming, this is, you know, this has happened in the past, it may happen again, and it certainly has implications for nickel systems. What has implications for nickel systems? Basically, if you mine ultramafic rocks, so very high magnesium rocks and serpentinites that contain nickel, a lot of commartiites, say in Western Australia, a big source of nickel of these rocks, the tailings, the fine grain waste that you generate naturally sequesters carbon dioxide. In other words, you mine the stuff, you extract the nickel, you leave the waste out in the air, and these reactions here that I'm not going to go into actually sequester carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. If you have these minerals like olivine or serpentinite or something like this, basically the, that means that your mine will actually actively sequester carbon dioxide, and that indicates that if you're mining the right types of rocks for nickel, you can effectively offset some of the carbon dioxide you produce by the mining process. In other words, if we have carbon trading, Nickel mines mining the right type of rocks could actually basically start to claim carbon credits for their operations, meaning that some currently sub-economic nickel projects may actually become economic if we move in this direction. If you want an example of that, this is the tailings pile at Mount Keith, Mount Keith in Western Australia, 300 million ton nickel deposit. Uh, the deposit generates about 11 million tons of serpentinite dominated tailings a year. If you actually look at this and monitor the carbon dioxide sequestration, it sequesters nearly 40,000 tons of atmospheric carbon dioxide a year, just by sitting there. Around 11% of carbon dioxide produced by mine site activities. If you try to enhance this, you could probably significantly increase this. If you have point sources of carbon dioxide nearby that you can feed into these, even better. So in other words, the significant carbon dioxide sequestration potential for active nickel deposits. A significant benefits and increased nickel supply potential if there is a move towards carbon trading. So there's all sorts of variables to think about here, not just in terms of where we might find metals, but how changes like carbon trading could affect the way we actually mine and what is and is not an economic deposit. The other thing to think about is where we mine, where we process and so on. The diagram at the bottom here, 
is actually looking at diamonds, but this equally applies to all kind of mining supply chains. There are actual rough diamonds mined, you know, each year, basically a value of 14.8 billion. The sales of those are 15.2 billion. If you cut them and polish them, you increase significantly the value polished diamond sales here. If you put them in jewelry, you know, you're basically talking about almost a tripling of value and then retail sales even more, even more so. Why am I showing you this? Because it's important to think about where we mine, where we process the metals, and where we do the manufacturing. If you take this graph here as a, say, let's say copper mining here in Arizona, what we do is then we ship the copper to China for a smelter, to manufacturing and so on, then buy the, buy the retail goods back from China or wherever it is, what we're doing is essentially shipping away a huge amount of value. We're also shipping away a huge amount of jobs, huge amount of other value add and so on. You can also think of it as similar to coffee. So in other words, coffee growers, if they sell their beans, they're going to get a certain amount of money, but that money is nowhere near as valuable as a cup of Starbucks in terms of the coffee contained and their value add and so on. So, you know, coffee from bean to roasted grass to Starbucks, where does value add in the growing countries or downstream? It's especially true for critical metals with their insecure supply chains. One example of this, Mountain Pass in California, just over the border uh, from us in Las Vegas, just down the I-15. We're mining rare earth element concentrates from Mountain Pass. And what we're doing right now, it's likely to change shortly, but what we're doing right now is we're shipping them to China for further processing. If we're worried about critical metals like the rare earths here in the US, what we don't want to do is mine those things, then ship them somewhere else for processing because that decreases the security supply and ships away some of the value. Same with Mount Weld in Australia. They mine rare earths there. They're processing them in Malaysia. Again, that's not a secure supply chain. We're shipping away value. We're shipping away security. We need to think not only about where we're mining things, but where we're processing, smelting them, where the manufacturing occurs as well. All of this kind of feeds into that security supply and also where the value accrues. There's a few other challenges and opportunities to think about other than the ones I've outlined today. Certainly finding the mineral deposits we need is not easy to meet these increasing demands that I've outlined. Ensuring that we make the most of the deposits is not easy. Again, we need to know our ore deposits better. We need to know where metals sit, how they deport, and how, where they deport, how they behave during mineral processing. We need to look at waste rock and tailings, not only to ensure increased mining amounts of mining, we can store these safely, but also how can we use them? And how can we use waste rock and tailings from previous mining, issue, uh, mining uh, uh, operations where we didn't extract the metals that are now of interest? We need to think about environmental, social, and governmental issues. These are basically going to increase. They're not going away anytime soon. We need to actually ensure we can mine where we want to mine. That means we need to embrace and understand these issues. There's also things called NIMBYs and bananas. Uh, NIMBYs are not in my backyard, which means, great, I want a Tesla, but I don't want mining anywhere near me, so go and do it somewhere else. Bananas are people who say, build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything. We don't need any more infrastructure development. We don't need any more mining whatsoever. Stop doing it. Just don't do it at all. But the fact is that, you know, the general public can't accept that, they, you know, you can't have solar power. They need to accept that you can't have solar power, Tesla vehicles, electric vehicles, and that raw materials. We need to have some acceptance that mining is required for met and that metals need to be smelted and refined. You, we can ship it elsewhere, ship the problems of smelting and processing elsewhere, but that means we lose security supply, we lose uh, value add, we just lose a whole load of things that, uh, we, 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 that we could accrue here if we actually did the processing and smelting here instead. It's not just mining, certainly concrete and cement is a huge carbon dioxide producer. We don't have a solution for that. At the minute, a metallurgical coal, we need that for blast furnaces and so on. There's some developments here, but there's going to be coal mining, certainly for metallurgical reasons, uh, into, the, into the significant future, I would say. The thing about uh, mining and climate change, the bottom line is, and the bottom line that we need to explain to people outside of the industry, is that if you want to do anything meaningful about climate change, we're going to have to mine more. We're going to, we already mine more than we ever have done before. We need to increase that to move towards carbon neutrality. 
creates lots of questions and problems. As I say, where are we going to find these metals and minerals? We need to understand geological processes that form mineral deposits. We need to increase the efficiency and efficacy of mining in terms of recovery and energy use. We, we don't just have to mine natural deposits. We can mine landfills. We can mine mining waste. And one of the questions here, how long will all this take? How can we expedite this? How can we actually make sure we're ready for increases in demand that we're seeing already? We need to think about the impacts of metal extraction, and we need to think about basically educating, not just educating students here at universities, but educating the general public, and probably importantly, educating policymakers. We need to inform people who make decisions at government level that if they make a policy, that policy has implications in terms of mining. If they say we're going to go all electric by 2050, they need to realize that that requires a lot of mining. We're doing some of this at Geoscience at UNLV. Yes, I need to have a plug for my own institution in here somewhere, uh, but we, we just need to make sure people understand the challenges and opportunities we're facing right now that are happening and affecting our industry already. Uh, so this is the kind of this is the the, the kind of last bit of, or, the, or the plug before I go through some kind of recent developments. So, you know, if you're not already convinced, everybody in this room should be convinced, hopefully. Uh, but if you're not already convinced, I emphasize again that everybody listening to this talk, either in person or recording later, needs mining. And we need to, as people who acknowledge that, we need to communicate that more widely. If you want modern society, modern standards of living, you need mining of metals and minerals. The devices you use for work and entertainment, the electricity you use, the car you drive, the house or apartment you live in, all the modern conveniences you have require metals and minerals. More importantly, Sustainable futures built on carbon neutrality are going to require more mining than we've ever mined, more metals than we've ever mined before. Lower carbon dioxide emissions and so on are going to be built on the back of the mining industry. There's no point having a Tesla fueled by a coal-fired power station. It doesn't work. If your attitude is climate change doesn't exist, the world is moving towards that anyway, and this is an opportunity for us to be leaders in the US, Nevada, Arizona. We know demand for these metals are increasing. It's a key driver going forward for the minerals industry. The question is, does the US want to be the world supplier of raw materials or a home of some of the high-tech manufacturing that is currently in China? If the latter, then we need to think about where we mine, where we get ores from, friendly countries like Australia and Canada, perhaps, as well as our own, and where we process them and where the manufacturing occurs. A few kind of headlines here. Uh, we're already seeing changes. Australia is moving away from just mining and actually thinking about processing critical metals in domestically. The challenges are enormous. Uh, Utah, so uh, Bingham Canyon is moving to produce tellurium, about 20 tons per year. The value of that tellurium will pay for the $3 million cost of that initial tellurium plant over, after three years. Plus also they're generating good headlines here. Uh, on the next slide, I swear I'm not paid by Rio Tinto, but they seem to be getting headlines. So Rio Tinto making lithium, Rio Tinto making scandium, all as byproducts. All of this, you know, doesn't actually cost Rio Tinto a huge amount, gives them some strategic metals to play around with, but also creates basically good publicity value. It's not necessarily all about the economics. And then we have things like Thacker Pass, a large lithium project in northern Nevada that's being held up uh, by uh, conflicts with indigenous communities, some environmental issues. Thacker Pass, if it's all mined out, has enough lithium for 300 million electric vehicles. So there's a significant potential here, but it's being held up by ESG issues, and these ESG issues are not going to go away anytime soon. <laughs> Rio Tinto again, but this is an interesting case study. So Jadar in Serbia was going to produce around 55,000 tons of lithium a year until the Serbian government turned around and said, no, you're not. Basically, the, the project had significant amounts of investment. They were moving towards production shortly, uh, but basically the Serbian government turned around, partly thanks to pressure from non-governmental organizations based in London in this case, uh, and basically turned around and said, no, you're not mining there. We're going to take your exploration license away citing local opposition. So there's all sorts of issues that are going on. Slightly closer to home in Minnesota, here on left, on the left here, we have a, a revoked mining lease for part of the Duluth complex, mining copper nickel platinum group elements. In another part of the Duluth complex, here we have the US Department of Energy giving them money to look at carbon storage potential. <coughs> so in other words, we have different approaches in different areas and so on. 
just gonna have a, a gulp of water. And then we have this, this is a red tape versus green minerals. We have a significant lithium deposit in this case in a pegmatite in Maine, contains a significant amount of lithium. The problem with Maine is that Maine is not very friendly towards mining. A problem in Maine is that the state regulations in 2017, which if you're gonna mine for metals in an open pit, you can't have more than three acres of size open pit, which is pretty darn small. So in other words, this is a really interesting potential uh, a lithium development, but actually the problem here is the state legislature's opposition to mining essentially. And there's also policymakers. We need to think about how realistic policymakers targets are. Half US cars to be zero emission by 2030, UK electric car sales being hit by global lithium shortages, and uh, basically solar panels in New Mexico not being finished because of supply chain issues. So we can have all the policies we want, but if we can't meet metal demands or, or material demands for the, the, the policies we're making, there's no point, in other words, making those policies. So just starting to wrap up, <clears throat> we certainly need more conversations and discussion of this rather than just saying we need to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. There's a lot of people saying that, but they need to realize the metal and metal and mineral cost of actually reducing those carbon dioxide emissions. We need more research, education, outreach, consideration of metal demand and supply during policy development. And we need more open conversations rather than just ignoring it. You can't have something like carbon dioxide emission reductions without knowing and accepting the cost of it. We could talk all we want about how we need to combat climate change. You can make policy to achieve this, but you don't understand and accept the mineral and metal costs of this, you're only halfway there. And that halfway is not gonna do anybody any good. So just to kind of wrap up, we already mine and recycle more metal than we ever have done before. That trend is underlying, it's not gonna go anywhere, and it's just gonna increase because of this transition to zero carbon dioxide emission technologies and so on. This increased demand is likely to be sustained until we get circular economies. That's not gonna happen for the next 20, 30, 40 years at least. And even then, not all metals can and will be recycled. Mining isn't going anywhere for a long time. And the trends we see already are likely to accelerate in terms of metal and mineral demand. This is all positive for people who want to get involved with the minerals industry. ESG challenges, environmental, social, governmental challenges are going to increase unless we can better engage with the public. Mining and farming is a comparison I often like to make. They're both crucial for modern life. They're both environmentally and socially problematic. So mining, we can talk about the environmental issues surrounding mining, the social issues. Farming has social issues, has environmental issues, things like nitrate runoff, deforestation, loss of biodiversity. But even in this room, I reckon if you said the words mining and farming to somebody, they immediately would have very different viewpoints. Mining is that dirty great hole in the ground that I showed on my second slide. Farming is a gentle cornfield, you know, blowing in the breeze, cows mooing in the background and everything perfect. That is not the reality of either of those industries, but that is the perception the public has. And that's something we need to deal with by actually talking to them about the importance of mining. So there's a huge range of future challenges, but all of these are also opportunities. The future looks bright, certainly for the minerals industry, certainly for economic geology. And we need to have, I would say, more of most, more of both here in the US. And that's about it. Uh, if anybody has any questions, you can always ask now. If not, you can always email me. I'm happy to pass on papers, this talk, and uh, continue this discussion. And there's loads more information that I could talk about. But at some point, we do need to wrap this up and have the refreshments outside and let you guys go home, potentially. Uh, but other than that, I'd uh, just like to say again, thank you for the opportunity for giving this talk. Thank you. Well, thanks, uh, Simon, for this very interesting talk. A lot of information about all these metals. I just try to bombard people so they don't have any questions at the end. <laughs> All right. So hopefully that's not the case. Does anyone have, have a question for Sam? Yeah. Uh, 
that's for the video. Oh, that's for the video. Okay. Okay. So, uh, hey, Simon, thank you Hi. very much for the talk. I was wondering in the discussion of material, uh, getting materials from mining versus recycling, there was obviously a good deal of waste, which you, you touched on losing a lot of critical elements to mine waste and so forth. Uh, I know another source of waste is using critical minerals or critical metals for things that don't really require them, like making eyeglass frames out of titanium when other things would do just as well. Do you have any sense of what fraction or how much metal we lose to that kind of misuse, for lack of a better term? Uh, it obviously depends on the metal. I mean, titanium is a good example of one for frames and for things like rings and things like that that people use. But I, I think proportionally the use of uh, most critical metals in that way is, is not very high. I think the other thing that, um, you know, titanium is a kind of one of the more major minor metals, if you like, and, and the price stability of titanium is fairly fairly constant, whereas if like jewelers start to make things with rare earth elements and they might get surprised by the price volatility in those areas. So I, I don't think there's a huge amount of use in that kind of waste area. And I think the other thing that if prices do go up, they're the areas we'll start to see drop off rapidly because they'll just, you know, they'll be out, out, out priced in the market and all of a sudden people won't want to pay a, a slight premium for their titanium rings or whatever. Gotcha. Thanks. Thanks for a very stimulating talk. Could, could you say a little bit about how this, this sort of upward path of uh, mining intersects with the geological abundance of the elements? I mean, there are certain elements that we know are short, and people have in the past tried to model them, but for example, the Gordon Nordhaus model for copper, it, electric vehicles weren't even on the horizon when they did that. Um, and similarly for the platinum group elements, um, if we replace uh, gasoline-powered vehicles with um, electric vehicles, then the demand for catalytic converters will go down. So how, how do you see these, these sort of trends um, either elongating or accelerating the exhaustion of, of particular elements? So, the, the, I mean, the, the platinum group elements is a, an interesting one because that's difficult to predict because obviously if we if we consider we're just going to go to lithium-ion batteries and remove all catalytic converters, then that, that one decreases demand for the platinum group elements and two brings an awful lot of platinum palladium back into supply and catalytic converters are really recyclable. But the other thing is we might change tack. We might go to fuel cells that actually involve the platinum group elements. So predicting that is difficult. And that where, that's where, for example, some of the, 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 the contrasting models of, say, cobalt and nickel come in because they're both used in lithium-ion batteries, but one could be more used than the other. And so that kind of technological prediction is something that if I was any good at, I probably wouldn't be stood here. I'd be kind of sat somewhere with a billion dollars on an island or something. Um, <laughs> to kind of touch on your, your other question, um, I mean, if you look at global demand for metals or global mined metal production and compared to global reserve estimates, what we have for an awful lot of metals is actually flat lines. So in other words, what we produce is being matched by the replenishment of reserves. We can see that for copper, we can see that for nickel, we can see that for most base metals. We probably don't have enough data for a lot of the critical metals, but we produced a paper in 2020 which actually looks at some of those trends and, and discusses those implications. And what we need to realize is that, you know, the minerals industry and their reserve resource reporting, you know, if, you, if a reserve, if, if you just look at, say, global reserves of copper, that's the stuff that we know is mined, is economically mineable. And that's actually a tiny fraction of the resources of copper, which is actually a tiny fraction of the mineralized material that mining companies can't delineate formally because of reserve re resource reporting. So something like Bingham Canyon, it's been mined for more than 100 years if you looked at the original kind of reserve estimates for that Bingham Canyon, it should have been exhausted a long time ago. If you look at the reserve estimates in the 80s, it should have probably been exhausted. It's just the way the minerals industry reports numbers and it, it goes into kind of lies, damn lies and statistics. You can manipulate them to say whatever you want, but if you do, then you could potentially be deliberately misusing the data. So I think there's more mineralized material than we 
than is actually certainly than is reported, but that mineralized material is known about. So, you know, Escondida, Chichicamata, a lot of the porphyry coppers around here have a long lifetime, but they may not be reflected in current reserve resource reporting because, because of the way we do that, thanks to various uh, um, uh, uh, issues in the past where people have overstated those to manipulate share markets and so on, um, basically means that we can't talk about all that extra mineralized material that companies may know is there. They can't formally report it. So I think at the moment, we're, our, our demand and resource or reserves are kind of flatlining. In other words, our production is being replenished at the same rate we're actually producing it. Whether that continues with this increasing demand on top of those increasing trends is another matter. I don't think we can do what we did, say, in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, or even earlier where we started mining differently because the stuff we consider all now was waste in the 1980s. And we can't do that continually because we're going to hit some of the you know, Skinner's mineralogical barrier where you can't actually, unless you have an unlimited supply of energy, you can't mine, you know, you can't mine biotite for copper. Um, so at some point there will become a, a situation where we are starting to run out, but when that is and how long away that is, and whether we actually achieve a circular economies before that happens are three questions that I think uh, need more research but are all worth considering. I think I've answered your question. I get carried away in answering questions. So it's <laughs> yeah, I just have a follow-up question. I was wondering if the if mining companies um have to report uh the resources for critical minerals or not. Do you know if they if they report those? It depends on the critical metal or mineral. Sorry, I think I zapped somebody in the audience with nothing. <laughs> Let me put this down. Uh it depends on the critical metal or mineral, depends on the value of that metal or mineral. So uh, if like on the Jork and I-43101 reporting, uh, from memory, if a metal is say 10% of a value of a deposit or greater, it has to be reported. I think if it's 10% or 5% or less, it can't be reported. So legally, like the Sierra to mine in Arizona here produces rhenium, I believe. And that rhenium can't be reported in reserve resource reporting, even though it's produced. So we have to think about that in a different way because some mining companies may not know what their deposits contain. Others may know, but they can't talk about it. And having communications with, you know, having spoken to some of those mining companies, there's a lot of both. And there's also a lot of people who just don't care because they don't think about the economic or strategic value of those metals until you tell them that the tellurium coming out of their deposit is worth about million dollars a year. What do you think is going to truly be the spur of change as far as you mentioned education, public policy, and educating public policy policy makers? Do you think it's either going to be a gradual sense of education to the public and the policymakers, or do you think it's going to be more on the flip side where we hit this crux where we're like, oh, we don't have these minerals we need, and that's going to be kind of the the domino that makes them all fall over. You know, what what, what do you think is going to be the the true uh, thing of change? I, I hope it's the former, but I think it might be the latter. Um, I, I mean, we are seeing more and more discussion of this um, in policymakers' spheres. Certainly on the rare earth elements in the early 2010s were a hot topic. Uh, basically, you know, if you speak to Larry Minot and people like that who were at the USGS at the time, if they wanted Congress to listen to things, they talked about rare earth elements because all of a sudden it was a big deal and, and China was controlling the supply and if China restricted exports, what implication did that have for the US military and so on? So I think there's increasing awareness of it. It's just that increased that awareness, the rate of that increase of awareness is pretty slow still. And I think until things start to happen, like some policymakers can't afford their Teslas because all of a sudden the price has doubled because of the price of nickel and lithium, then I, you know, I, I don't, I don't think we'll see kind of meaningful change. And I, I think, you know, change happens rapidly in crises. And I think we may need a crisis here for this to happen, which is not a good thing, right? I don't want it to happen, but I think that 
you know, the rate of progress is so glacial otherwise at times that I don't think, um, I, you know, I don't, I don't see it happening as a, I don't see people waking up tomorrow and going, oh, wow, critical metals and mining, this is crucial. I think they've got other things to think about, and this is always at the back of their mind, if they're even thinking about it at all. So uh, I think some sort of crisis to stimulate people's attention, uh, especially in, you know, the US in general is not a country that thinks about mining much compared to, say, Australia or our neighbours to the north, which is weird because the geology kind of continues across the US-Canadian border. But um, I think, you know, I think until something drives home how important thinking about all this is, then uh, I don't think anything will change. And it might have to be a big crisis of some sort because we're seeing that, you know, we've seen things like uh, increased frequency of tornadoes, hurricanes, and so on, thanks to climate change. And that's not stopped people really doing the stuff they want to do anyway. So uh, I think unless you actually hit policymakers right in their back pockets in some way, or in their likelihood of being voted elect, re-elected, I think we may be facing slow progress. I, could, I hope I'm wrong. And I apologize for the somewhat fruity language on the recording, although... I've used worse in my lectures, so. Do I have two questions? Well, I'll, I'll repeat them on here as well for the recording, so. First question is, you mentioned on the rare client path. What's your speculation? Is that their subsidiary or part ownership is the client subsidiary? The U.S. government is going to actually force them out of being part of Mount Pat with all that resource data working in the U.S. Uh, I'll I'll deal with that first. So the first question was uh, whether like Mountain Pass, for example, is part owned by a Chinese company. Whether the U.S. government will force that Chinese company to relinquish that ownership. Uh, what the chances of that? I mean, we've seen that in Canada already with lithium companies, like Chinese part ownership of lithium companies being being forcibly, you know, the Canadian government is essentially moving to remove foreign or problematic foreign ownership of, uh, of strategic mineral deposits. Uh, I think the U.S. has a bit more of a laissez-faire attitude than the Canadians at times. Uh, and I think, I don't, I don't know. I mean, if they were really concerned about security of supply, then they would act in that way and probably think about other companies as well, not just Mountain Pass. But I, I don't know. I don't. I, it depends. I don't, I don't know if the U.S. government will act in the same way as the Canadians are. Um, I don't think they will because I think they'll see that at Mountain Pass, at least, the processing is going to happen here in the U.S. and therefore they don't need to worry about that part Chinese ownership. I think they'll just keep things as they are because. If they start interfering in private ownership of companies without a good reason, then certain people will be very critical of that. I don't know. It's it's a it's an interesting question for sure. The other the other question dealt with CO two sequestration and monitoring of that. What do you foresee being the driver? While there are companies working on goodwill to work on their CO two footprint and diminishing that. Or do you see in that taking hold as the driver or the federal government with through ESG implementing policy to penalize companies for excess CO2 emissions as being the driver? Uh, that's a difficult one again. I think, um, I mean, is it a carrot or is it a stick? In other words, um, for CO2 sequestration, I think there's a move already for mining companies to be more efficient and to employ electric vehicles, electric haul trucks, and things like that. So we're already seeing that happen in certain parts of the world. Uh, that, of course, requires infrastructure and so on, and there needs to be kind of financial incentives to do those developments. I think the, the most efficient way of making companies do that is probably the stick approach by or, or some sort of beneficial approach like carbon trading. But again... Bringing that in in the U.S. compared to, say, Australia or Canada or other countries um, may be, you know, unless you have a kind of global agreement or agreement, say, with the with the European Union where they buy things at a premium if they're going to low carbon emission or something like that, unless there's a, a big carrot there, I think that carbon trading isn't going to come in here in the U.S. 
and unless the efficiencies offered by like electric haul trucks and so on are, are significant, then I think it might have to be a stick approach. And I don't think anybody has the willingness to do that here. So um, I think what we may see is the US in terms of carbon emissions and efficiencies at mine sites actually kind of falling behind the rest of the world a little because of politics and policy makers. I mean, I, I hope I'm incorrect again. Uh, this is me gazing into my crystal ball and as I'm an associate professor at UNLV, my crystal ball isn't very effective. <laughs> but um, uh, that would be my take on that. So that tropical island does await me at some point, I'm sure. All right. Any more questions for Simon? Uh, yeah, after you talked about people that really didn't want like mines in their backyard and things like that, I was wondering if you had were, I uh, apologize, uh, I have mild aphasia, word finding is difficult. Um, if you had thought that there might be a point where we might need to have mines in our backyards, especially with um, population growing as it is and cities maybe not being able to accommodate it with the size that they are, I was wondering if there could be a point that mines could get to a point where they wouldn't have as much pollution to where we could have them in our backyards. I mean, there are certain places where you do have mines in your backyard already and um, like, uh, you know, towns here in the US, uh, certainly Mount Isa in uh, Kalgoorlie, Western Australia and so on, the, where mines are directly by a town and the only reason the town is there is because of the mines originally. But um, I think that what we need to do on the ESG side of things is mitigate or decrease the environmental issues uh, and we know what they are uh, we're getting better at mitigating and understanding them mitigating against them uh, and we need to emphasize that you know local communities can and should benefit from mining traditionally you know people have looked at uh, mineral deposits and mineral resources as, as almost like a resource curse in other words if you're say an african or south american country with significant mineral resources traditionally you know in the last 40, 50 years, those resources have not always benefited the country as best they can. Mining companies are actively moving to change that. There's a lot of discussion going on at that right now. Um, at recent conferences I've been to, uh, there's a lot of emphasis on the, the benefits that communities can get from local mines. There's a lot of, there's a few good cases uh, where indigenous communities, for example, have engaged well with uh, with local mines like Raglan in North Quebec, engaging with the Inuit communities up there and bringing jobs, bringing other financial benefits. Um, but, you know, those good cases are still a bit few and far between. And I think if we, we're going to have to mine more, it's going to have to happen somewhere. And as I say, we can either do it here where we can control the environmental issues, ensure that communities benefit and keep the value here, the jobs here, or we can do it somewhere else where we can't control all of those and we lose out in terms of the security supply and other things like that. So I think there's certainly nobody, well, unless you're a geologist, maybe nobody really wants a dirty great hole next year to look at each day. I mean, I wouldn't mind, but my partner would probably complain. Um, she's not a geologist. Um, but I think that, um, uh, you know, I think, I think that we just need to be a little better as what we're doing, a little better at communicating, a little better engaging. We need to do that anyway, because these ESG issues are not going away at all. They're only going to increase. Thank you. All right. Well, I think we'll continue the discussion outside. Um, thank you all for coming. The next talk is going to be next month uh, in 24th of January. And uh, let's give a last round of applause for uh, Simon.